Hi, Colin. I want to thank Hello. you so much for taking my call and for agreeing to um, interview with the Hingham Current and talk about your project that is in process. Yes. Um, it's very cool to us that you're not just a Hingham native, but that you chose to film your movie Magnolia Flowers in Hingham. So we'd love to kind of dig into that and find out a little bit more. Could you just give us a little bit of background on yourself? Yeah, so I grew up um, in Hingham. I was born in Newton and lived, grew up on uh, grew up on Sherwood Road in Hingham, 25 Sherwood. Um, with um, it was a kind of like a small street with a whole array of families, all of whom, most of whom I still uh, am in touch with. Most of whom are still family friends. Then I moved into uh, Turkey Hill uh, from there. Uh, which is where my parents live now, um, which is a beautiful spot. And I think it's a place where um, I've done a lot of artistic development, I would say, because it's so, it's so beautiful and inspiring to me. Um, and I come up with a lot of ideas still when I go back there, uh, when I go on walks up at Turkey Hill and things like that. Um, I went to Hingham Middle School for sixth grade, um, and then I went to Boston College High School for six years. So I went for seventh, eighth grade, and then all of high school. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of my best friends from Hingham also went to Boston College High School, um, which I was very lucky for me, and I'm still great friends with all of them. Uh, so I then went to USC from BC High, um, and I went to their film school, uh, which was a... Uh, I mean, a life-changing experience. Um, being in Los Angeles, I think, took me out of my comfort zone in a big way. Um, and it definitely changed me forever in a positive way. But it was, I think, the past four years uh, when I was at USC were definitely years of, um, I would say, expedited, <laughs> uh, expedited, sorry, not expedited, expedited growth for sure personal growth and then um uh, from there i and, and even when i was at usc i would still spend summers in, Hing in hingham i would say the only summer i didn't spend in hingham um was my, the summer going into my senior year because i was doing an internship at um the showtime networks um and yeah and then i during my senior year at usc which was this past year I mean, last year, rather, 2019, 2020, I applied to the American Film Institute um, in their screenwriting fellowship, um, and I was accepted to my, I would say just, just not really to my, I guess to my, partly to my surprise, but I was just extremely thrilled to get, have that opportunity because it was probably the, um, it was, it was just, the, it was, it, it was a big deal for me. Um, and so I'm there now. I'm at the American Film Institute now. So I'm living in Los Angeles right now. Um, but I'm definitely always a, a Hingham person at heart. I mean, I'm very proud of where I come from. I'm very proud that I was very proud and very grateful that I was raised in Hingham. Um, and yeah, it's such a beautiful place. So, but that is a little bit about me um, and where I'm at, I guess, where I started and where I'm at now. So. Fantastic. Did you, were you involved in the drama program at all in middle school or at Boston College High? I wasn't. I actually really wish I had been because I was terrible at sports. Um, and I wish, I think I felt more pressure to play sports than, and, and probably more pressure in the opposite direction to not do drama. Um, and so I was really, my creative outlet in middle school was um and high school was really writing and it's it's kind of always been that way i mean it was filmmaking when i was a little kid and then i kind of dropped filmmaking for a little bit and then in middle school i discovered prose writing and would just write all the time short stories not, not even just prose and verse as well like i write poems i write short stories and then that short stories and poems turned into screenplays when i was in high school um but I was completely uninvolved in like 
you know, drama, um, the drama program at Hingham, you know, when I was in middle school or at BC High. Um, I wish I had been because it would probably have opened me up in a way. Um, it probably would. It probably would have helped me become more vulnerable as an artist earlier. Um, I don't. I don't think I would have been an actor. I think I probably would have gravitated back towards uh, filmmaking and directing. But um, no, I was not. Is is the short answer to that? So, what was your first official project? Um, official. Official is an interesting word. I. I've been making films uh, since I was a little kid. Like literally since Sherwood Road. Um, one of my best friends, Pat Green, um, who I saw the other day, he um, he and I would just run around with my dad's like VHS camcorder, which don't they don't exist anymore. But um, we'd run around with like my dad's VHS camcorder and just film like our own movies, and that was the genesis of like and I could never explain to anyone why I did that and that's why I just think it's kind of in my blood because it's just like I just did it and it was the most fun thing to me was just making up stories on the fly and just filming them with my friends um but then my first like actual short film where I wrote a script cast the actors etc that was I, I it was actually it was a project I did in a um film class at BC High when I was a 10th grader and at the time like I told like I said like I hadn't been um I had dropped filmmaking for some reason I think it was just like middle school self-consciousness and I had dropped filmmaking for a bit um and then I took this 10th grade <clears throat> um I took this filmmaking class in 10th grade and with a guy named Mr. Hernandez and it completely changed the way I looked at movies and so I never watched a movie the same way ever again which was a profound experience because then I just started noticing the way things were framed and editing and I became aware of all the elements that that make up a film and then I was like I you know I made my first official film in that class and then just kind of like never stopped so I just like you know, after I was done with that one, I wanted to do another one, and then I wanted to do another one. So that it came to a point where I was always working on a new project, and that's where I'm at now. That's just my default is is I'm always kind of prepping a new a new project. So, but yeah, I guess the first official one was tenth grade. And what's your favorite aspect of filmmaking? Um, it seems to change a little. It seems to fluctuate over time. I'm definitely a writer. So coming up with stuff on the page and, and putting together like a text that the actors work from is always exciting. Um, and it's where I spend a lot of time. I think my favorite aspect is working with actors. I definitely write, I write scripts so that I can see the words come out of the actors' mouths. And that's just like developing performances with actors and <sighs> developing characters and you know, inventing people that they, that the actors then become, that's like the most profound aspect of it, I think. And it's the one that's the most exciting to me. And it's probably the one I devote the most energy to when I'm making a movie, so. And what would you say is your favorite genre, if you have one? Um, ah, man, I really, really, there's a few. One of them is the gangster genre, which is obviously like an iconic, distinctly American genre. Um, I just, I, gangster movies to me are just, there's so much you can do with them and that you can say so much about American society with gangster movies. And that's why I say like distinctly American because it's like, it, sure, like, you know, um, mafia stories exist in, in other cultures, but it's, Gangster movies have always managed to say something really important about American culture and capitalism and things like that. Um, I would say, yeah, the, the gangster genre, and then I'm just like a sucker for just a dramatic thriller. Just like, you know, something that's really, really tightly wound, um, you know, where a character is, is just thrust into 
<clears throat> a completely foreign situation and, and changes as a person uh, as a result kind of over like a, a very short period of time with like a ticking clock you know that's like I, I love thrillers too so yeah so your current project is Magnolia Flowers mm -hmm. what was your inspiration for that film um Magnolia Flowers uh okay so I started trying to write it when I was in high school um and it was terrible uh, um so i had all the characters down but it's just i didn't know anything about writing a, a feature length screenplay and i probably just wasn't ready at the time to like actually follow through with one so i tried to write one i think i probably wrote like 45 or so pages of it um i think it was called something else and then i I was, in, I was like a sophomore at USC, and I spoke to this kid, Ben Butler, who is also a filmmaker, and had just finished his first feature film. He's, he's a little bit older than me. Um, and he was like, if you're really serious about this, you should be making a feature film right now and stuff. And he was just trying to like light a fire under my, under my ass a little bit. Pardon my language, but. Um, and, he, and he did. And then I realized that like, okay, the, I loved the characters I had in the previous version, but it wasn't working because the scenario I put them in wasn't working. So I, I completely did away with the scenario, kept all the characters, and just transferred their story over into a completely fresh story. And I started reading some books, um, you know, stuff that I felt like was in the vein um, of what I wanted to do. Um, the Virgin Suicides being, being one of the books I read. Um, and so I got really, really inspired and figured out my, my tone and, and what, what, what I think I wanted my characters, what kind of journey I wanted them to go on. And all the characters are based on, um, almost all of them are based on real people that I know, um, which I'm sure people won't believe when they see the movie. But um, some of them are based on my best friends who I've known forever, like so, since, you know, people I grew up with in, in Hingham and just on the South Shore. Um, some of them are based on my best friends. I would say the main character, Caitlin, is completely fictionalized. Um, so she is the core of the movie and she's fictionalized, but she's surrounded by um, characters that are based on um, my best friends. And obviously it is, it is, it is fiction. So when I say they're based on my best friends, it's, I guess I just mean like the essence of the of the human, not like you know things the the person has actually done. But um, so you pulled some attributes from them. Yes, it was like channeling like yes, it was, exactly. It was like channeling their spirit and then funneling that into a into a character into like and then obviously that helped me learn how to write like three dimensional characters because I had to I care to, I care about the real people so I had to like I had to care just as much about these fictional characters I was inventing so yeah my inspiration was yeah like my friends um, and it was also at the time um, <clears throat> my other inspiration was was um, some mental health issues that I was having which were undiagnosed at the time, I had, um, when I was writing, I had um, what I thought at the time was just like generalized anxiety. Um, and of course, um, I hadn't sought out therapy yet, which was a mistake, but that's a different story. Um, but over the course of the, like a year or so during which I wrote the script, I was kind of funneling, um, I was kind of funneling my internal struggle with my mental health issues into the script, which of course is, is, is helpful and not helpful. Um, helpful in the sense that like, it is like art is therapeutic, but if you're not taking care of yourself and going to therapy and actually dealing with things, then um, it can only do so much. And so I would say that year is actually the year when, this, this is all, that year was when I had, um, when I was actually almost like, when I was getting, I was getting close to trying to think. Yeah, that the year when I basically had the script 
done was also the year when I had my first like major panic attack and was kind of forced into therapy, not forced into, but it, it seemed absolutely necessary at that point that I go into therapy. And what I learned was that I had um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which is a widely misunderstood disorder as I learned because I had it and, and almost knew I had it, but like at the same time didn't know. Um, and I figured out I, that I had it by watching a movie um, called The Aviator um, with, with Leo DiCaprio where he plays Howard Hughes and Howard Hughes has crippling obsessive compulsive disorder. And I remember resonating with, and at the time that Howard Hughes was alive, no one knew what that was. And I remember just resonating with um, this man's struggle, like as it was portrayed on the screen. And then I looked it up and I realized, oh, he had OCB, which was undiagnosed at the time. And so I <clears throat> then realized I had OCB and I've been in therapy since then. Um, so I've been in therapy for like over a year and a half, um, and have completely, it's completely changed my life. So I've, what's interesting about the script is that I have really, really grown with it. Um, almost to the extent that I've outgrown it. So by the time we shot it, it did feel a little bit like I had outgrown it already. Um, which is not a cynical or negative thing, that's just how filmmaking tends to work, or at least from what I've heard um, from people who have like full careers already. Like, you know, by the time you make something, it's probably like from the, you know, from the inception of the idea to the production, it's probably like three to five years minimum if it's a film. Um, so if you, you really have to be so passionate and emotionally invested in the project usually to like want to go through that to go through the tribulations that'll happen over three to five years. Um, and with Magnolia Flowers, a lot has happened since I conceived of the idea um, to when I just shot it this past July. Like a lot, I've changed a lot and I've grown in a, in a positive way. But I think what I channeled into the script was a lot of my fear that existed prior to dealing with some of my mental health issues. Um, so anyway, that was a super long-winded answer, but, um, no, I, I really appreciate your candor. I mean, that's, yeah. it's very interesting. Everybody has their own sources of inspiration. Usually they're deeply personal and yours obviously was. So thank you for sharing all of that. Of course. Um, on a, on a lighter note, how did you choose Hingham or why did you choose Hingham? Was it out of convenience or was there something about, um, the landscape of Hingham that compelled you to film here? It's such a beautiful, I mean, I think I said it before, um, when I'm home, I spend so much time just in the woods, like a bit like, um, uh, Ware River, you know, Whitney Thayer Woods and like up at the hilltop there, Ware River, like the, uh, that overlooks the city. I mean, it's just so much really, really gorgeous scenery. It's just, I feel like it's it's really like godly almost it's it's a very it's just such a beautiful um landscape and every time i go back to it i just feel so it's like nature is like welcoming me back it really is like it's it's um it's it's really really beautiful so it's it, i think as a setting for a film even if i wasn't from Hingham, i mean it's it'd be perfect i mean it's 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 beautiful and it's kind of scary like at night a little bit it's almost spooky um, so maybe I'll film a horror film one day and hang on, but, um, it's, it's, to me, it's just like, I, I really do think like the world kind of comes to a head, um, in Hingham in terms of just the landscape and, um, it's kind of like sheer beauty, but I mean, just being from Hingham, I wrote the story, you know, knowing it was going to take place in Hingham. So, you know, especially since some of the characters are based on my f own friends, like, I imagined the story as I was writing it taking place in Hingham. So to me, there was no, um, to me, there was no other option, you know, other than to shoot it in Hingham. And also the amount of support that I received from, from people is part of what made it possible. Um, shooting your first feature is really hard because if you're shooting in territory that's not, that you don't have a personal connection to, it becomes very difficult. 
you know, for a lot of reasons. Because, uh, you know, local people will, will, will be confused about what's going on and why you're shooting there. The authorities might be confused. They might be more reluctant to, like, you know, shoot in certain places. And so, you know, coming and shooting in my hometown, people were just immediately, I feel like, I don't, I don't have any, I didn't have any money to offer or anything in the way of that, but people were just receptive on the basis that, like, I grew up here. Um, the, the, the police department was very receptive and worked with me. The, um, the, like, town officials worked with me. Um, business owners where I was trying to film were working with me. And, um, you know, I had, I had, you know, my friends helping me out with some stuff. Um, people letting me use their homes for a day, you know, friends of mine. So it was like, you know, it was a no brainer. And that's like, it really is part of what made the movie possible at all. Um, was just <clears throat> people's receptiveness to what I was doing and also like them embracing what I was doing because I'm like a local kid. Um, so yeah, that's that's those are all the reasons why I, I decided to shoot him for sure. Great. And then so as you were wrapping up shooting, mm -hmm. COVID struck. COVID's yes. had a significant impact on all kinds of production opportunities, mm -hmm. both, you know, Hollywood, locally, New York. Yeah. What impact did COVID have on what you were doing? Or did you just squeak out under the under the tail end? So we we didn't just squeak out. So what happened was <laughs> it was frustrating. We had been prepping the movie since let me get this right. Since May of 2019. So we had been prepping the movie by the time March came around, March 2020. We were like thinking of shooting in May. So we were supposed to shoot initially in May of 2020. So which would have been like a year after kind of fully prepping, starting prep on the movie in May 2019. Obviously I had to completely switch that plan um, once, you know, the country really started going into lockdown in March, I had to really switch that plan up and we had to switch to July. And truth be told, I was banking on switching to July. My thought process was, I felt like Massachusetts was taking the, the, the pandemic seriously. Um, and so it seemed to me like, and as time went on, this became more obvious. It seemed to me like regulations would allow for us to film starting in July. And I, and I was right. And literally like the regulations allowing filming in Massachusetts, um, kicked into gear like the, like a week before we were about to film in July. Um, so the timing was perfect. We basically had a, you know, an ideal window in which we were, you know, legally by state regulations allowed to shoot. People in the town were aware. I stayed in touch with everyone who I had been in touch with at all these locations. And I was like, listen, I'm not gonna shoot in May, obviously. I'm gonna shoot in July. What do you think about that? And people kind of continued to work with me. Um, <laughs> And we, uh, we made it happen. I mean, it's like, you literally couldn't have made up, you know, the universe couldn't have invented a, a more of an obstacle, I don't think, um, to, to making the movie, and yet we still did. Um, and we were, you know, everyone's wearing masks. We had uh, procedures for sanitizing things, because there were certain, we were filming at, like, my own house for a little bit. So there were procedures uh, on set for sanitizing things. We had outdoor bathrooms. Uh, we had like a tent that people outdoors that people stayed in uh, when they weren't shooting. Um, there was hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, so we just took it. I was kind of going off of like industry. Um, the industry now is getting really, really getting back to work now. It, it, it already had been in July a little bit, but I was going off of the industry had invented what was called the white paper. And that was just like a base kind of set of guidelines for how sets should be run safely. 
And so I was kind of used, I developed my own safety guidelines based on that. Um, and so I had like full rules in place um, to keep people safe. And yeah, it they worked. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we shot safely, no one got sick. Um, it was, and we like got our film shot like the way we wanted to. Um, in a highly, highly efficient manner as well. And uh, so no, we didn't just like, we kind of eked it out, but it was like, you know, with a lot of preparation and like shifting our expectations, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Fantastic. So you're in post-production Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that you expect to have the film completed by January 21, at which point you will be um, making the circuit, doing film festivals and things like that. Mm -hmm. What do you anticipate that looking like? So I think I'm actually, my, I, I, want, I wonder if um, I told Greg January, I've shifted my deadline to summer 2021 with the anticipation of, well, a couple things. Summer 2021, it, it will be done. Um, and I, I would love to have um, some sort of screening in Ham um, that people could actually come to. We'll have to see whether that's possible. Um, so that people could actually see the movie. But then from there, um, I will be taking the, the movie into like the festival circuit for 2021, 2022, because festivals run from you know September through January. So it'll go over into the 2022 calendar year um i i'm gonna aim high um i want the film to get into sundance i want it to get into south by southwest i want it to get into the austin film festival i want it to get into tribeca um you know i i i'm really insistent on that i think it's a quality piece of work um i think i you know, I have a lot of confidence in the script. I have a lot of confidence in my actors. I have a lot of confidence in uh, the people on my crew who made things happen. I think it's a quality film. I don't think people are going to be expecting um, what they're going to see, um, which is going to be like a, a film that looks like it's, you know what I mean? That looks like it's a million dollar movie when it's, we made it for $40,000. Um, it's, yeah, it's a quality piece of work, and I, I think we're going to have success on the festival circuit. From there, uh, the festival circuit is really a, a gateway to getting distribution. I hope the film gets distribution somewhere. I mean, my goal is, like, I would love to have it end up on Netflix. Um, that's, like, my, you know, upper echelon goal. Um, but, you know, hopefully, it, if, if not on Netflix, hopefully it ends up somewhere else, um, you know, perhaps on a, on a smaller network's um, movie catalog or, um, you know, somewhere else. Like it, it's, it's, uh, it, there are a lot of homes for movies now. That's the reality. People just think that, you know, theatrical releases are only for the biggest films, but then from there, uh, movies end up all sorts of places, um, as I've learned. So the, I think there really is a home for this movie somewhere. Um, and I'm, you know, it's not like I'm going to get rich off of that. Um, but it's like, I, what I want is for my movie to find a home. Um, and I want people to be able to watch it um, in a way that does it justice. Because the cast and crew worked so hard and spared with me over the course of over a year. Um, and so, and it's also just a, it's a quality entertaining film. Uh, and I'm still working on it, obviously, but I'm already seeing it come together and I'm, I'm really, really excited and thrilled about it. So, Terrific. um, yeah, that's fantastic. So once yes. it wraps, it may be a little premature to ask you this, but, um, sure. what are some of your upcoming projects? Do you have any plans to branch yeah. out into TV or stage or is film your, your thing? Film is definitely my main medium. I have TV, TV, excuse me. I have TV ideas, um, one of which I was actually, um, one of which I, I would like to pitch down the line pretty soon. Um, it's a project called Sweetheart. Um, 
I'm very excited about that. I one of the actors, two of the actors um, that I worked with on Magnolia Flowers are actually involved in that project. Um, so I'll be probably be shooting some sort of short film as kind of a proof of concept for that. And that is like a, a, a TV series. So I'll be shooting that probably this coming summer. Um, I have another project, uh, a film that I would like to do as a follow-up to Magnolia Flowers. Um, definitely another indie project um, called Dreams of Self-Destruction, um, which is... Um, there's kind of like a little snippet of, about it on my IMDb, but um, that's a, a big passion project like Magnolia Flowers that I've been working on for several years. Um, and I, I really would like to leverage, if I have any festival success, I'd like to hopefully leverage it to get that project done. Um, but I have other scripts kind of in the can as well in that I'm working on. Uh, I think film... Over time, I've just, I've continued to see that film is my medium. I'm really not as interested in um, going into television. I really do want to do movies, but I do have television ideas. So, I, you know, I, I remain open to that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I definitely have other things in the pipeline as well, so. All right, so final question. Do you, is there any advice that you would give to other young people who are considering a career in film? Yeah, yes. Hmm, let me think. I think you can't wait for people to give you permission to make your movie. I think some people, the peers of mine that I see making awesome movies, um, you know, it feature like films, like, like, you know, the peers of mine who I see doing this on, on a similar um, level or even a greater level than me already. So like not to say that I'm like some sort of benchmark. Um, <clears throat> they didn't wait. They like me didn't wait for anyone to give them the green light to do it. Like they gave themselves the green light. Um, and the reality is that you have to do that. I just don't think the era i think the era of like you know being a director who doesn't write and just waits around for the next project and someone offers you to direct something i think that's kind of over i think we're headed back towards like a 1960s um french new wave kind of model where directors are writers and directors are really showing the way that they um the way that they look at the world on on screen um and so yeah i think it's give yourself um give yourself the green light and also write i mean i think being a writer i think every director in the next 10 years i think what we're going to see is that any director who's working is a writer in some form um that's already kind of true there are still like non-writing directors but I really think people who are putting up money for any sort of project are looking for storytellers and what they really mean by looking for storytellers are they're looking for writers. Um, so being a writer in some form is going to take you far um, because then you can turn out your own stories and have your own stories on paper and, and do what you want with those. Um, yeah, those are my two bits of advice are give yourself the green light and become a writer. You know, I, I those are really my two. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Well, those are all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think, um, I think that's it. This was great. Thank you for letting me just, I feel like I talked, I talked a lot. Uh, well, that was kind of the point. Okay, okay, good, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I know I think I said I said a lot. Um, you did say a lot. This has been a yeah. really great interview. I, I thank you for taking the time to talk with me and for going into such great detail in your responses to the questions that I had for you. It's been yeah. really enjoyable. Thank you so much. And I, I want to really, wish really you appreciate this. Yep, wishing you all the best of luck as you wrap up Magnolia Flowers and great success in your career. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Colin. Thank you. Bye-bye.